My guest today is Elton Stoneman. Elton, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on. I'm looking forward to, to talking about containers and Azure and all things uh, Docker. Uh, you know a lot about Docker because you work for Docker, right? Absolutely. So uh, before I joined Docker, I've been with Docker for sort of two and a half years now. Mm -hmm. Before I joined Docker, I was a .NET consultant, so mm -hmm. I spent most of my career building big enterprise .NET projects. Mm -hmm. We used to call them best practice, N-tier uh, designs and now we call them big ugly legacy monoliths. <laughs> so, uh, they and were then cool ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say, but speaking of your past, I, that I I went through a lot of your plural site courses, mostly the big data stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so learned I a lot from that. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So I did a chunk of stuff where I was working on a project uh, where I was I was building um, APIs that ran in Azure, and they were consuming events from uh, an Android tablet. And so I was working on the API side of things, but then I got into the, the analytics side and we were using uh, HD Insight and, uh, and Event Hubs and all that cool stuff when it was coming out. But actually on that project, the team that I was working with, so I was, I was kind of heading up the, the, the C Sharp side of it, the .NET side of it, the team I was working with who were building the tablets, they were all Linux people. Right. And this was 2014 and Docker was just starting to get interesting and they were using Docker for a lot of their tooling. Um, and then I'd, I've always, I've always been a Windows person, but I've always had a little Linux server at home okay. uh, to run a few things for the house, and I never got comfortable enough because I, I would only log in once a month right. and I'd forget all the all the commands, and then I'd read about this fantastic open source project and go to the documentation and I'd have to download the source code and build it and nothing worked and so like you know, and then Docker came along and suddenly all this stuff's already packaged up for you. So if you want to oh. run this open source app, you just do Docker run and it's, it's there. And that that light bulb went and I thought this is the way forward. So then I, I joined Docker. Oh, uh, what is Docker? <laughs> so Docker, Docker is a um, it's a virtualization technology, but right. it's virtualizing at the app level. So imagine imagine I've got a um, a .NET application that's running in IIS, so it's an ASP uh, uh, web application. All right. So the actual process that's running that is this thing called W three WP. Dot exe. That's okay. that's my process that runs that runs my application. If I run that in a container, then that process runs directly on the server where I'm running my container. So there's okay. no there's no with a virtual machine. There's a copy of the operating system, and then you get the actual operating system. Okay. With a container, you don't have that. Inside my container, I'm running directly on the server. But there's this boundary around that process, which is the container. Hmm. So inside the container, I think I'm on my own machine. I've got an IP address. I've got a server name. I've got a C drive. I've got a registry. I could, I'm completely. So you, as a developer, and you as a user, it looks just like a, you're sitting at a machine. Uh, yeah, exactly. But it is a container. Yes, yes. So from uh, and from the application's point of view, from the inside, it just looks like I'm running on Windows Server. But from the outside, um, I've got this. I've, I've got this boundary around it. So containers can't see each other unless you unless you connect them through a, through a network mm. um, and they're isolated but they're super lightweight mm -hmm. so I can run so I, I, I'm, we're here at DevSum mm -hmm. uh, I do a workshop where I, I, I show people how to, to put their applications into containers and how to modernize the architecture of these big monoliths um, and during that workshop I end up running like 15 containers on this this tiny VM in Azure so I've got oh. like a two core machine with seven gig of RAM and it's running like all th these dozens of containers with Elasticsearch and, and all sorts of interesting stuff and they're so lightweight you can just run lots of them. Oh, okay. Are they talking to each other? Yes, yes, yes. So you can run. So when you run your container, um, you can. You, Docker has also has doesn't just manage containers; it also manages the packaging and the distribution. But when you're running your application, you can create a, a virtual network, a Docker okay. network, and all the containers within that network can reach each other just by the DNS name. So just like an ordinary deployment. Okay. So uh, is this uh, through some kind of web service or something that they communicate or what? No, no. So all, it sounds like it's all out of process. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, so when I'm running these things in a container, I'm running everything through Docker. Oh. So, so on my server, I install Windows, and I install Docker, and that, that runs as a background Windows service. All the applications that I run, I, I run them through Docker. So I say, Docker, start this application, Docker, start that application. And then the apps themselves in the containers, they're going to connect through the network. So yeah, I okay. can have I can have a, my website is consuming from an API, is talking to a message queue, they're all in containers. Okay. Is there is there any difference between running all of that locally on uh, a virtual machine versus running them in the cloud? So, so that's the beauty of it. No, there's no difference at all. So the, these things are completely portable. So, uh, so the Docker platform has the the runtime to run my container, mm -hmm. my application in this in this containerized environment. But it also has the packaging. So I can I can package up my whole application into this thing called a Docker image, mm -hmm. and I can share that either publicly or privately within my organization. And anyone who has access to that image, um, the only the only prerequisite they have is Docker, and they can run the exact application, and it'll be the exact same behavior that that. 
I have on my machine. So okay. I can run this stuff anywhere. So I can I can install Docker locally, which is uh, just a free download, right? Yeah, yeah. Or I can deploy it to something like Azure or AWS, which has Docker as a service built into it. Yeah, absolutely. So so the, the, the only real difference there is when I'm running locally, I'm running on a single machine. I'm running on my laptop. I can install Docker desktop for Windows 10 or for the Mac, and I can either run Linux or Windows containers. When I run in production, I'm going to have a cluster. I'm going to have a set of servers uh, that, that are all joined together. Um, they're all running Docker, but I don't, I don't tell the cluster to run an individual container. I give the cluster um, a definition of the application that I want to run, and it decides where to run the containers. So oh. it'll, it'll, it'll work out, I'm going to put a container here because I've got capacity. I'm going to put one there. They're all connected through these virtual networks. Um, there, are, there are two major technologies for that. One's called Docker Swarm, and the other one's called Kubernetes, which everyone's heard of Kubernetes. The cloud <laughs> okay, fact, not everyone's fact, heard of Kubernetes. Well. <laughs> what are those technologies actually doing? So, so they both do, uh, at a high level, the same thing. They're, they're the clustering technology. Okay. So, so the idea there is I deploy my application to the cluster. The cluster manages my containers for me, mm -hmm. and it keeps my application healthy. Okay. So if, I, if I've got a server that's running, so, so you know, in, in production, I'm going to have a, a, a cluster of maybe a dozen machines. Mm -hmm. I'm running maybe 50 instances of my web application containers for, for scalability and performance and all that stuff. Okay. So, so one of my servers may be running five web containers. Now, if that server goes down, I've lost my five web containers. Okay. But the cluster is monitoring all that, and it says, you've, you've asked me to have 50 containers. Five have just gone, so I'm going to start another five somewhere else. Okay. So, so the idea is I get, I get to the point of having these, these applications which are self-healing, so the, 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 the cluster manages it for me, um, and I don't have to worry about, you know, I don't get a call at two in the morning saying a server's gone down. I wouldn't even know about it. Right. So that, that's nice in the fact that the server comes back up again. But what about state? my state if I'm in the middle of a transaction, for example? So good question. So statefulness is a, uh, it, it, you can do state in containers. So I did an entire plural site course about that. <laughs> but actually, <Nine. laughs> um, what most people tend to do at the moment is they put the state uh, in a separate service. So so imagine if I'm running like a, um, an application where I've got, I've got an, a an API, a web front end and a database. Uh, in my test environments, I'm going to run everything in containers. So maybe I've got a SQL Server container, I've got uh, my, my web application container, and my API container. When I go to production, uh, I'm probably going to use a managed database service. So if I'm running in Azure, um, there's no real benefit in me running a SQL Server container when I can use SQL Azure, which is the backups are managed for me, the, you know, the availability. That's all platform service. Exactly. And all, all I change there is the configuration setting. So my, my application that's in the container can still obviously talk to external services. Uh, basically, connection string is Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then, so as part of my deployment, I've got my, my container specification that says, here's my API, but I've also got the configuration that lives in the cluster, and I tell it to go and talk to, to SQL Azure. So, so you can do state in containers, um, but but certainly for now, people are tending to say, I'm going to use the the, the the application layer is going to run in containers, and then like the database layer I'm going to have outside. Wow. So now that you've uh, you've Kind of discovered containers, discovered Docker. You're, you're sort of living in this world. Is there any reason not to use containers, not to use Docker, just to deploy a bare metal or just on a virtual machine? Do it the old-fashioned way. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> so yeah, I would. So, so I mean, there, there are some things that you have to you have to be aware of. So, to get your application running in a container, you have to write this really simple script called a called a Docker file, and that script basically. Is your is your deployment script? So instead of having a, a Word document that says commission a new Windows server, install IIS, install .NET, do this, do this, do this, you've got it all scripted in this in this simple deployment document called a Docker file. Um, there are some things that you, especially in the Windows world, you can run your Windows application in a Windows container on Docker. Um, You'll be, it'll be based on Windows Server 2019, which means you're running the latest version of Windows Server inside your app. Uh, but that's obviously backwards compatible. So I can take my, uh, my .NET 2 Web Forms application, write a Docker file, and I can run that in a container without changing code. I don't even need to have the code. I can, inside my Docker file, I can deploy an MSI. So I can take my existing application. But I mean, there are some things that you can't do in containers. So it doesn't, um, the container's isolated from the host. So if, I'm, if I've got, 
like literally got hardware peripherals that plug in that use some unusual connectivity I, i'm not going to be able to access them from the container so there are some there are some edge cases where it doesn't work okay. but everything else if because because like i package up my whole application um all of its dependencies in this reusable portable package then like you never get the issue where i've done a deployment to the test environment that works okay but then when i promote it to production it fails because i've forgotten to do something because okay. my promotion to production is running a container from the same package that i tested okay so it keeps environments a lot uh, more consistent and also that deployment script is more consistent uh, because it's scripted absolutely and that that deployment script lives in your source code so your docker file lives in the source code you can if you're you can compile within the container so i don't even need a build server because i can use docker to compile my app as well as to package it up and um and and then the 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 doc the 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 definition of what the the whole application looks like. So, if it's a distributed app that runs across several containers, that definition lives in source code too, and that's the thing that I deploy. So, so you can version it as well. You can version it, yeah, absolutely. And and the beauty of that is, if you're looking at um, uh, so the Docker is often kind of the, the center point to people's transformation programs because they want to, to be able to move to the cloud, but an easy way to do that is to move to containers first, or they're still in the data center, but they want to um, update their infrastructure. Well, again, you know, if they're running stuff on Windows 2003 or 2008, they're coming out of service, so it's an easy way to, to make the migration. But also there's, there's the cultural thing too. So if you're moving more towards a devops -y way of doing things. One of the hardest things is that I've got this dev team uh, who never ever spoke to the ops team except to, to, to blame each other for things going wrong. And they speak different languages. So, you know, in the dev world, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about MS Build and I'm talking C Sharp or whatever. Um, in the production world, I'm using SCOM uh, or I'm using Nagios and there's no, there's no similarity. But when, I, when my packaging artifact is my Docker file and my deployment artifact is this other thing called a Docker Compose file, they're jointly owned by Dev and Ops. They're speaking the same languages, they're using the same tools. It really helps that, that team to start working together. Interesting. So let's blame. <laughs> oh, you can't guarantee that. But <laughs> that part. <laughs> Uh, this is a lot of stuff. But so um, I mean, this is—I know there's a lot more to it, but this is a good foundation, I think. Unless is there something uh, that people to get people started on using Docker and containers that we haven't discussed? Uh, so. No, I don't think so. I mean, so it's, it's really easy to get started with. So, I mean, the thing Let's that, talk about that. How, how do you get started? yeah, okay. So, the, the fundamental thing you need to understand is that uh, uh, containers are evolved in the in the Linux world. So, they evolved as part of the Linux operating yeah. system. Linux is a little bit late to the game, but catching up. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, and then Windows Server 2016 and Windows 10 are the other versions of Windows where you can run a Windows container. Um, and so, so what you'll see if, if you're just getting started with this, uh, a lot of the documentation is kind of in the Linuxy world. And if you're a Windows person, you need to to dig a little bit deeper to find the Windows versions, but actually, then the, the path is really simple. You mean you learn how to how to build. A, first of all, so the, the learning path that I that I kind of guide people on is first of all, you just run some containers. Mm -hmm. So the the packaging format, the the Docker image that contains an application. Um, there there are public images that are maintained by by Microsoft, so I can get an image that's got IIS installed, mm -hmm. and I can literally do. Um, so I install Docker desktop uh, on my Windows 10 machine. I do Docker container run and then like a, a name which is like Microsoft slash IIS. Okay, so and then a command line. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a command line thing. thing. Um, and then I'm going to I'm gonna have IIS running in a container. So it will download the package. It'll start the container up. Inside that container, I'll have IIS running. And then I can connect to it just like any other, any other IIS um, web server. And, and then, so you learn how to use other people's containers. Then you learn the Docker file syntax, which is, which is really simple, because actually mostly um, you're saying which, which, which other package you're starting from. So if, it's, if I've got a .NET uh, uh, website, I'm going to start from Microsoft's ASP.NET image. So that's already got Windows Server, IIS, ASP.NET, all configured for me. Okay. Microsoft take care of updating that with the Windows updates and everything. So, so my Docker file says I'm going to start from Microsoft's ASP.NET image, and then I'm going to package in my source code or my MSI or whatever I'm doing. Mm. So, so firstly, you run some containers, then you try packaging your own app to run the container, um, and then there's a you know the next the next stage is distributed applications with many containers, and then you're going to learn a thing called Docker Compose. So it's it's Docker, it's Docker files, and it's the Compose file. And from that point, um, then you're, you're pretty solidly on your way. Very cool. Um, if I wanted to get uh, learn more, where's a good place online to go? 
so the, the 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 Docker documentation is is pretty good, so we keep those up to date. Uh, there, if you're a Pluralsight person, there's a Pluralsight learning path which has got Windows and Linux containers in there. There's a whole stack of stuff there. Um, if you're more of a reading person, then uh, you can get my book. Your book, yeah. <laughs> my book, yeah. Docker Docker on Windows. Uh, so it's uh, published by Pact. Mm -hmm. So it's it's purely about Windows containers. It t it tells you about running .NET apps, breaking down monoliths, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you're more into uh, self-paced learning, then the workshop that I do, all the content for that is online. It's all you can you can follow along with it yourself. So all you need is Windows 10 with Docker Desktop installed. Um, it's got the terrible URL. The URL is dwwx for Docker Windows Workshop dot space because that's the cheapest domain you can buy. <laughs> so it's, if you go to dwwx.space, um, all the slides are there, and then the code behind's in GitHub, and you can follow it along. It starts from zero all the way up to things you need to bear in mind when you go into production, um, what the cluster looks like, all that stuff. So if you want to pace along with that, then that's the, that's the way to start. Some of these side courses are yours. Yeah, yeah, I've got broad side courses on. Uh, so the one that's probably most relevant here is called modernizing .NET apps with Docker. So it takes you on that journey of uh, here's what my application looks like. It's a big monolith. It'd be nice if it was microservice architecture, but uh, if I've got a two million line legacy app, it's going to take me two years to rewrite it. So the approach I take is is take a feature out. So so package the whole thing to run in a container first. Then look at the features that are going to give you value if they if they if they can be run in a separate container. That means I can update them independently of the monolith. Exactly. So yeah. So I, I guide you through that. So I'm a big fan. I think you can get like a 30-day trial for free and decide whether you want to buy it. But um, it's worth it. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Spent my whole, I've spent my whole career working with technology and I've done some really interesting stuff. I've been fortunate enough to work on some really interesting projects and got stuck into some great technologies. I've helped teach people get further along their career path. But actually the, the most beneficial thing I've found is, is the friends you make along the way. So I've been to, fortunate enough to speak at conferences, to speak at meetups, to help mentor new speakers, uh, to help people in their career and made friendships that are, that are long lasting. So the technology will die, all the projects we write will sometimes be replaced, but the friendships will, will last on.